You, you know, the, the, I, I've been praying through several weeks now on what to preach. I'm starting actually two new series. Today in the morning, uh, we're starting the book of Acts. And then tonight, uh, we'll start a new series on the Ten Commandments. Uh, but in, over the last couple of months, and, and I've been praying, and I've asked Chris to pray as well uh, with me through what God would lead me to preach after finishing up uh, the sort of the summer series that we had through the Psalms and several questions as I prayed, as I spent time with God in my devotional time and just prayer time, and, and several questions continued to come to my mind as I asked him, Lord, where would you have me go in your word? And, and here, here's, here, here's a question uh, that, that came, one, one specific question. Is, listen, is there a difference between the first century church and the 21st century church? And if so, what is it? And here's where the Lord led me. Let, just let me, let me take you on a journey of where he led me. He led me to the last book of the Bible. And not only the last book of the Bible, but he led me to the last chapter of the last book of the written word of God. And here's the thing that he shared with me uh, in my prayer time. Is there a difference in the first century church with the 21st century church? And if there's a difference, what is it? And I believe that I figured it out. Here's the difference in Revelation 22, 7. says it three times in the last chapter of the book. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. Even back over in the, in the next verse, uh, of tw uh, verse 22 in Revelation 20, uh, 22, uh, verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with you. And then the last thing the Lord says, the last thing, the red letters, if you will, the last thing he says that is written down is, Behold, I surely am I coming quickly. He's coming quickly. So I ask, what is the difference between the first century church and the 21st century church? Here it is, urgency. Urgency. Let, let me ask you a question. If you don't believe that, here, look, with all the resources the 21st century church has, I mean, we got more money, more buildings, more Christian education. Look, we got preaching and we got prayer. Sometimes we don't have it like we should. We don't depend on prayer like we should, but we have it. We got fellowship. Uh, but there's one thing we don't have, and it's urgency. Let me ask you a question. Did you wake up this morning even thinking that Christ could come back before you got to church? I know we all say, well, I know he's coming back, and he is because he says he is. And you can say, well, he could come today or he could come tomorrow. You might say that, but can I ask you, do you live like it? These folks live like he might come back before the night falls. And so urgency is the thing that came to mind. When was the last time? Listen, I've posed this question to myself the last couple of months. When's the last time you believed the Lord could come back this very day? See, the book of Acts is a powerful account of the birth and the advancement of the church after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ascension. It's, it's called by some the first volume of church history. I want to remind you that the only Gentile writer of the Bible wrote the book of Acts. Luke. Luke, the physician, the, the companion of Paul, also gave us the book, book the Gospel of Luke. It, it would seem that Luke, who set out to write a history of Jesus' life and the expansion of the church up to his own age, decided to do it in two scrolls. The book of Luke, the book of Acts. The first scroll contained the life of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel. That's Calvary. And the second scroll uh, was the story of the church. And he carried it all the way up to the arrival of the apostle Paul in Rome about 30 years later. So we're talking about a 30-year period of when Christ ascended until this book. He may have been putting together... Some say a personal defense for Paul as he stood before Nero. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of Christ's expectation following his preparation. He prepped these guys because he knew he was going to be leaving. And there was an expectation for him. See, when he left and ascended to heaven, he did not stop leading. 
He gave the Holy Spirit, and they were to be led by the person, power, and presence of the Holy Spirit. Dr. A.T. Pearson called it, look, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. This is the book of Acts. Acts helps us to see the power and presence of God. As he gives us the principles of discipling and, and, and building the church. By the way, he builds the church. There's no strategy that builds the church. He builds it. If there's a strategy, it's this book right here. It's, it's evangelizing the lost. It's, it's, it's sharing the gospel. You want to know how the church is built? Don't look for church growth books. Look to this book. Now, I want you to notice what he has given them. We ain't even got started yet. <laughs> it's almost like a mission impossible. I mean, here they are. Look at them. This little group, bunch of ragtag fishermen. Some of them are fishermen. They're unlettered. Most of them, as Agent Roger said, they don't have an ed any education. They don't have any college behind them. They have no seminaries. They have no finances. They have no, they have no prestige. They have no political pull. But they had one thing that mattered. The Holy Spirit of God. The Bible tells us, Jesus said to them, You receive power after the Holy Ghost is upon you. And you shall be my witnesses unto Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. This book reads as a magnificent novel, but it's absolute truth. This book of Acts. And so if you would stand with me, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We might get through verse 3 today. Might. The Bible reads here, the former account I made, oh... Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he has taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive. Now, that's important, alive. After his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you speak to us this morning. And God, may we know the power of the gospel. And God, may we share the story that still changes everything. For we pray it in your name, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The message of the gospel is the hope of the world. It is our story, and it is the hope of the world. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, uh, on Jesus' story. It's the story that still changes everything. The first thing that we see here is a lasting story. There's a lasting story to report. The former account I made, oh, Theophilus, this former account refer, refers back to the first scroll, the gospel of Luke. Josh McDowell believes the two books, Luke and Acts, are just one, just a continuation of each other. Of all that Jesus began to do and teach, the Bible says, the Acts, according to Luke, is a continuation of the teachings and actions of all that Jesus did. And can I tell you, he's still doing now. He's still teaching now through the Holy Spirit. Uh, that interesting, that verb began it's a present infinitive. The language here is a linear action. It means still going on in the present tense. Aren't you glad the Lord's still working? Yes. I said, aren't you glad the Lord's still working? Yes. I know this. He's still working on me. I ain't what I used to be, but I ain't all that I ought to be either. And I know a few of you, y'all in the same boat I am, rowing with me together. <laughs> All that Jesus began, it is, it is the present tense. That's what I love about Jesus. He, what he began, he's still doing. He, if he began it, he'll finish it. Amen? Amen? I mean, that's what I love this morning, family. On the authority of God's word, Jesus is still working. I know he's still working. Luke speaks to say as if Jesus is carrying on from heaven the work and teaching of the disciples, which he started while he was on earth before his ascension. So when the Bible says Jesus began, it uses a word that means no ending. 
He continues to work. But one day, one day he's coming back. We just sung about it. All, did y'all know all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, speak of the work of Jesus Christ as finished? I don't want you to be mistaken. His work for us at Calvary, He did finish that work. His great work of redemption is finished and nothing can be added. When Jesus died on the cross, He said, to Telestai, paid in full, it's done. John 17, 4 says, I've glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Wouldn't that be great for that to be all of our prayer? God, I've finished the work that you've got for me to do. Even though the work of Jesus Christ is finished, that is Calvary. Thank God that he is not only the way, he's not only made a way, he is the way. And thank God he's still working. Now look, Jesus died on the cross, was buried on that Friday, but early on Sunday morning, hallelujah, early Sunday morning he got up. He conquered sin, hell, death, the grave, and his work to redeem mankind was finished. So I don't want to minimize the finality, the once for all saving work of Christ. Because that part was finished. But there's unfinished business because there's people still lost. And he left us work to do. When Jesus Christ cried is finished, the debt was paid, the sins were covered, the wrath was removed, and Satan was defeated. But I want to stress here that Jesus, what he did on earth in his tough, compassionate, loving, healing deeds and what he said on earth in his truthful, authoritative, convicting and comforting teaching was only the beginning of his doing and teaching. Because at the foot of the cross and at the empty tomb is where our work began. I know that because the very first person that saw him had to go back, saw that he wasn't in there, went and told somebody he wasn't in there. And people's been telling the story ever since. His work of evangelism is not finished. His great commission and commandments are unfinished. The book of Acts chronicles the initial stages and characteristics of that unfinished work and sets uh, sets the path the church has to follow until the end. You know, he says, I'll be with you until the end. That's good news because that's long enough. Amen? Amen. He's going to be with me to the end, whether it's the end of me and he takes me home before I die or where he allows me to to, to, to go through death here on earth. I prefer the, 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 the first part. Just rapture me on up, Lord. See, the Lord's placed us here that we would finish his work on this side of heaven. Listen, it won't do any good to start the work of evangelism when you get to heaven because everybody there is already saved. It won't do any good. There'll be no evangelizing in heaven because the clear implication is that now, now that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, he's not dead, he's alive. He's present, he's doing and he's teaching. He does now in this age until the appointed time when the Lord's going to say, go get my children and then he's going to come back. And he's coming back. He told it. He taught it. He proclaimed it. And one day it's going to happen. The urgency. The urgency of the first century church. He goes on to say, after through the Holy Spirit has given, he had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Commandments. That's interesting. Refers directly to what we call the Great Commission given the apostles before his ascension. All four Gospels give an account of Christ given the Great Commission to share the story. You're still wondering what the story is? I'll tell it to you again. He died for you and for me and for our sins. Hung on a rugged cross. We just sung about it. But on the third day, he rose again. He's alive and well. And if you'll just ask him to come into your heart, to come into your life, to repent and to save you from your sins, he'll do it. I know he'll do it because he did it for me. That's the story of the gospel. It's simple. It's a simple message he told them. And he told them, he said, go and tell it. Go and tell them. Go and tell them. Go tell them the lasting story. 
How many people around this church? How many people around this church? How many people around your work? How many people around your school? How many people in your neighborhood are lost right now, headed for hell, that need to hear the lasting story? Who's going to tell them? It ought to be us. I heard a preacher say one time, we need either rally in what has been done or we can get committed to what's left undone. That's a good word. We need to rally about it and we can sit back and go, oh, Lord, look at all you've done. When there's people, listen, people that will die today. Look, when I leave this place here in just a little bit, I got to ride to Asheboro, North Carolina, down there. My aunt's going to die it's probably sometime between now and tomorrow, more than likely. She's 85 years old, but as, long, as far as I know, she don't know the Lord. And my cousin texted me last night. I was looking over this passage. He texted me. He's just burdened. I mean, just it was tearing him up. He had went and saw her. He said, Terry, I want you to go see her. Can you go see her? I said, I'm headed down there tomorrow right after church. He texted me about 8.30, 9 o'clock last night. I said, I'm going down there after church. He said, please tell her. Urgency. We need to rally in what's been done or we can get committed to what's left undone. And that is the unfinished task, the taking of the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We need to be taking the gospel to the neighborhood and to the nations. I want you to listen to me. The, bless, the, the best place to share the gospel is the places you go. That's what the Bible says. As you go, proclaim Christ your neighborhood, your workplace, your school, your family. The marketplace where the Lord has placed you is the place of your witness. So can I ask you this morning, any witnessing going on where you are? Let us take what we know, what we've experienced, and share it with the lost. It's the story of the book of Acts. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, had given orders by the source and the power of his ministry, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of power for believers' ministry, enables us to obey the Lord's teaching. Did you know ain't none of us in here would obey the Lord if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit. He caught, listen, he caught, Jesus called, he commissioned, he equipped them for one reason, and that was to give folks the messages of salvation and how to be saved. In John 20, 21 and 22, it says, Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I send you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. And when, when he had said this, he breathed on them. Y'all know why he breathed on them? Because without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be worth two cent in our work. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Spirit. Did y'all know these 12 men made a radical difference? Did y'all know that? 12 ordinary men. We're still talking about them 2,000 years later. They didn't have a platform. Listen, none of them had books that they had written at this particular time. Look, they didn't have a seminary degree or a DR in front of their name. Can I tell you that won't matter? When God equips you, that's the equipping you want. I know some that would rather be known as scholarly. Some want to be cool and culturally relative. All so that the lost world would accept them. I wrote this statement down. It won't matter if they accept you if they reject Jesus. It won't matter if they say, oh, I just love your teaching. If they reject Jesus, it won't matter. People just trying to be accepted by a lost and dying world. And look, we need the lost and dying world accepting what we've accepted, Jesus. Not the other way around. We got, we got politicians trying to say they can say, can't even save themselves, let alone us. And look, I, the, the, the more I look at their saving, the, the, I don't want none of that. A lasting story to present. We've got a story to present. We are to witness to a lost and dying world. I'm going to ask you again, any witnessing going on where you are? 
not only a lasting story, but we got a living Savior to proclaim. It says to him, look, to whom he also presented himself alive. By the way, ain't it, ain't it just awesome to know he's alive? That he still ain't in the grave? He presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There's a few things that we see here. We see his presentation, Christ's presentation of himself. Look, he, the verb presented, listen, is rendered in a variety of ways in the New Testament as to give or to furnish, to present, to provide, to assist. The original meaning is to place beside or to commend to the attention, hence to set before the mind, present and show. He presented and showed himself alive. See, they needed to know that he was alive. Can I tell you, it had been real hard for them to follow a dead Savior. They needed to see him alive. I believe that's why Jesus showed them he was alive over a 40-day period before he ascended. They needed to know he was alive. The early disciples, including Paul, never doubted the fact of the resurrection once they were convinced by personal experience. Can I tell you, when you've been convinced by a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, it won't matter who tells you he don't, he is not alive and he don't save. You know the difference. When you've personally encountered a loving, living Savior who died for you, rose again to save you from your sins, to atone for the debt that you owe. At first, some doubted like Thomas, but after that, they never wavered in their testimony to their own experience with the risen Christ. We see his presentation. We also see the passion. Uh, you know, uh, all of us have probably seen that movie, The Passion, that was a long, it's been made several years ago. Uh, that when it talks about his passion, it says after his suffering. That's what it speaks of, what we, know, what we know as of the passion of Christ, his crucifixion, and all that the Lord went through at Calvary. He's presented himself alive, and then he mentions his passion to say, I did go through that. I did die. But I didn't stay dead. Then he talks about proofs. Infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. History of the 40 days after the resurrection. He came and went, sort of. Showed himself different places, different times. Overcoming the unbelief and the hesitation of his disciples. So that in the end, they were absolutely convinced. You, want to know, you don't know how convinced they were? 11 out of the 12 died because they were so convinced. And the one that didn't die should have been dead. He just exiled over there in Patmos. But he, did, he stayed alive long enough to write us that last book. Every one of them but one was totally convinced to the point that they were willing to die for it. Infallible proofs. They would soon be commissioned to take the gospel to the entire world. And Jesus was giving them the spiritual fortitude for future ministry. That's just how good a Savior is. He not only saves you, he sanctifies you, and he just says, hey, I'll give you the spiritual fortitude to move forward in what I've called you and equipped you to do. Infallible proofs. It's a technical term for logic, meaning demonstrated evidence to prove by sure signs. I think about that song. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. I was thinking about it this week. I was down there at the beach watching them come in, watching them go out. That's waves. Watching them come in, watching them go out. It's just relaxing to hear the ocean move because you know the one who spoke it into existence, he'll tell the tide to come just as high as he wants it to be that day. And I started thinking, Lord, you've been too good to me. I shouldn't even be down here. You've been so good to me. I can see the evidence of your goodness all over. Evidence. Infallible proofs. You know, did y'all know Peter denied Christ? Ain't that interesting? He denied him, but when he saw him alive, he's willing to die for him. One day he's denying him, the next day he's ready to die for him. 
Why? Because he saw him alive. Thomas said, unless I see the nail-pierced hands, doubt turned into devotion when he saw Jesus alive and said, my Lord and my God. Infallible proofs. Evidence of a risen Savior. Can I say this to you this morning, family? Our lives ought to provide evidence as well. If you're a born-again, blood-bought believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your life ought to bear witness. There ought to be evidence in it. People ought to be able to say, I see the goodness of God all over their lives. Is he alive in your life this morning? Is there evidence? Let me ask you another question. Have you reported to anyone lately he's alive? I'll ask you even a more pointed question. When's the last time you told somebody Jesus is alive? Church, we've got a lasting story. It won't go away. They've tried to shut it down and they tried to shut them up. And they said, hey, I can't help but speak of the things I've seen and heard. We'll, we'll handle that. Lord knows when. That'll be in several weeks, maybe even a couple months in Acts 4. They've been trying to shut the story down since it began at an empty tomb. won't go away we got a world right now that's trying to shut it down by the way they're doing it a little different they're just trying to cancel it out as if it never happened they're trying to camouflage it in with other things oh well you can believe that but you got to believe this too can I tell you there's nothing that needs to be added to the perfect salvation that he gave he doesn't need help saving anybody he, what he did was sufficient for all. They tried to shut it down, but it keeps getting told. And praise God for those that are bold enough to keep telling it. The last thing we see is a principle here. And speaking of the things pertaining, pertaining to the kingdom of God. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the Lord in his uh, almost 33 years of life on this earth had one thing in mind the whole time. God's business. Everything was kingdom focused. I just wonder sometimes if the church... The reason we don't see the Lord moving the way these folks in the first century saw him move is we're preoccupied with other things other than the kingdom. And let me tell you something. When you're preoccupied with other things other than the kingdom, that means you don't have your mind on the king either. It speaks of the absolute rule and reign of God in their hearts. The rule of God then and the future reign of his kingdom coming. Did I tell you he's coming? Did I tell you he's coming again? You know, I began this message with the fact that he's coming back and the urgency that was real. Question for us this morning, is it real to us? Is that urgency real to us? You know, I'll close with this illustration. You know, we're down on the beach. We're just having a good time soaking up the sun. And uh, I look down there and Tammy's found somebody to talk to. Interesting enough, that's usually me that finds somebody to talk to. You know what I mean? 
And so I look down there. She's walked down to the water because she'll get, she'll get hot. You know, she says, I'm getting hot. And so she'll walk down to the water. And so I look down there, and she's talking to this lady. And so uh, I'm just sort of watching, you know, and, and everything. And then I see her, this lady's husband walking up towards the, the, the umbrella there where we're sitting. And he comes up, and, and he starts talking to me. And he says, yeah, your, your wife's telling me that, you know, you're a pastor and, and, uh, and telling me all about your church and stuff. They live in southern Kentucky where all the, the, the uh, flooding's going on. Somebody gave them the, the, the unit that they were staying in for the week. Gave it to them. And they were talking, and, and, and they've been through a lot, and I won't, I won't get into it. Uh, but they lost a son that was murdered. Just had a lot going on in their lives. And he said this, there's no coincidence that your wife come up and started talking to us. You never know who you going to touch by just starting a kingdom conversation with somebody. You never know. But you got to start a kingdom conversation. See, we'd have never known how to pray for them had Tam not just started up a conversation. Never known that we need to be praying for them on multiple levels had we not. Went up and started talking. We need to start talking about the kingdom. We need to start talking about the king. We've got a lasting story that, by the way, when everything else is said and done, it's going to go away. The only thing that's going to be left, this. going to ask the question one more time and we're going to close any witnessing going on where you are well on behalf of our pastor Terry Smith and the entire congregation of Living Water Baptist Church I want to thank you for listening to this online message we pray you have been encouraged and challenged we at Living Water believe that every time God's Word is communicated, it requires a response. The Bible tells us in James 1.22 that we are to be doers of the Word and not just hearers only. So what response do you need to make to be faithful to what you've heard? You can let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org. Maybe you need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or possibly you've already been saved but still need to be baptized. Or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership. Or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, be sure to email us at decision at lwbctriad.org. We can't wait to minister to you. And before you go, don't forget that you can keep up with everything happening at Living Water by visiting us online at www.lwbctriad.org. And you can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you in person this Sunday.